Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to the first of the winter series of lectures for 2017-18. Tonight, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Ken Galloway, the archivist of the Astronomy Historical Society. Ken has meticulously prepared uh, a series of photos taken from an archive. It's quite, it's quite varied, and I have not been privy to see more than two or three of them, but I, I know it is quite varied. Uh, I've seen his notes. And I'm a wee, wee bit frightened about one or two photos that are starting off to begin with. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to hold you back. I think you all know Ken anyway. He's meticulously prepares for everything from fishing to golf to everything. I was in his class in school and I was left miles behind. <laughs> I'll hand you over to Ken now. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorary President, uh, Chair, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me to open the Historical Society's winter seri series of lectures for 2017-18. Um, I'll be sharing with you individual portrait photos, photos of small groups, photos of large groups, and some photos of enormous groups. Judging from the good turnout tonight, it's clear that everyone loves photographs, especially when they involve people. We'll be looking at old photos and some more recent photos. Some may be new to you, others may bring back personal memories. I'll dwell on some photos for slightly longer when there's a story to tell. I will include pieces of history which have links to some of the photos displayed. And I want to let you know just now the society plans to source equipment which will allow slideshows to take place continuously on our premises in the town hall. There may be also be occasions tonight when I might seek your assistance in identifying some of the faces. In the first few slides, I'm going to describe the various styles of photo which we hold, methods used to name faces, and how some photos might be linked by comparison. And in an audience like we have tonight, I would expect a mixture of emotions ranging from embarrassment or unease that you are in a photo to disappointment or relief that you're not. So we'll start off with a primary six photograph from 1958, which includes some well-known faces. As I was in that class, I know them all, but I just want to pick out a few, a couple from the back row. Apologies for the mouse. Donald MacDonald, Dolan, well-known church minister. Two along from him. Roddy Jardine, when last I saw Roddy, he was uh, the harbour master down in Castleby. Then in the next row, afraid the mouse is not very good, folks, but we'll do the best we can. That's myself there, and just moving along the row, that smart guy in the glasses is Kenneth McKeever, son of John Angus McKeever, the primary headmaster. And uh, you still hear about uh, Kenneth on the news. He's still a pr practicing uh, high court judge. Moving down to the next row, This is Joanne Robertson, daughter of a uh, well-known fireman and plumber from Keith Street. And along at the end, Ian Henry Morrison from Westview Terrace, the stays just up the road from our own chair, Malcolm. Moving on to the next row. Here, Christine McCush, who became a teacher of English in the Nicholson Institute. And in the front row, we Murdo Angie McRae. And last but not least, here, our own chair, Malcolm. Good hair. <laughs> My description of the previous photo was quite straightforward because I knew the faces. Uh, in my role as an archivist with the society, I try to identify as many faces as possible in photos, but I'm always playing catch-up. 
Single portraits are easier with the condition that somebody knows that face and has written something on the back of the, of the photo. I didn't know anything about this one, but this one, in fact, is Mary Mackay, daughter of Thomas Mackay, Sir James Matheson's piper. This gentleman here with a fancy moustache is Sergeant Major John Troncher, Royal Artillery, who was the instructor at the Stornoway Battery in 1906. And these are just a couple of examples of what we call portrait photos. Here we see a photo of the first Stornoway Girl Guides. Now the Girl Guides at that time were linked to the Nicholson Institute. Don't go to sleep on me. This uh, photograph is easy because all the girls are in lines and they're easily identifiable by back row, left to right, etc. The first guide meeting was held on the 24th of August, 1934. And right in the middle, the two officers, Miss Thane, Captain and Mrs. McCrae, Lieutenant. They were actually formally presented with their warrants to run the girl guides by Mrs. Sterling of Fairburn, who was the County Commissioner for Rosshire. And as I say, linking the photos is, linking the photo with names is absolutely straightforward. But it's not always as easy as that. Here is a very large congregation of people my God, here we go. <clears throat> Supposed to just press PC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A large congregation of people outside the free church on Kenneth Street. Only one face is known to the society, and that is George Mackay, the Reverend George Mackay, right in the middle. This glass plate camera system photograph was the work of William MacLeod Jr. in 1910. An enlargement of the photo is on display in the society's premises in the town hall. Now, please remember the names William Mackay and William MacLeod and George Mackay, as I will re return to these two names later in the presentation. This one is from the John A. Smith collection, snapped in the town hall in the 1960s, precise date not known. Now, following a long list of consultations and discussions, the Society has managed to name a large number of faces in this image. I'll leave it on view for a few moments. In fact, I'm pretty sure I can see somebody who just walked in the door a wee while ago, sitting right there. And the glasses on the left. Murdoch MacLeod. Over here. Dean Crawford. And a wee over. Lost the mouse. We over here, Wapti. Uh -huh. And as I say, we've managed to identify quite a quite a large number. I think in the region of forty faces in that photograph. And it's from the John A. Smith Smith collection, D.L.'s brother. Then we encounter photographs of enormous crowds of faces, where the environment, location, and the event become much more important than the faces themselves. This photo, a hard copy of which was accessed by Society Committee member John Norman MacDonald, was taken from the front of the Lewis War Memorial, looking downhill at the unveiling ceremony by Lord Leverhulme in September 1924. And it's looking right across, more or less, what is the golf course now? Impressive photo. Mm -hmm. 
In this photo, there are 19 scouts and two leaders randomly dispersed across the deck of a ferry. So there's no back row left to right here. So how are the names recorded for posterity? Now the method I use, and if you look at the left side, is to scan the photo with excessively high brightness and then mark round the, the heads of the people in the photo in their position. Allocate them a number and then in the key to the photograph link the numbers to the people. And that's how that's the method I use when they're randomly dispersed. Here is the whole photo on screen with some well known Stornoway boys. <coughs> Two leaders, this one, Nori McGregor, Ian McKeever, Shorty, Kenneth McKeever, <coughs> can't remember his name, David Longbotham, my own cousin David McLennan, Ewan Evans, Sandy Roger, <coughs> Billy Rome, Ian R. M. Smith, who has done at least one, if not two, lectures for the Society. And up here, Lulu, Wapti's brother. On this side of Norrie McGregor, Bill Morrison. Now, I could not have remembered all these names had it not been for the key that I was using uh, in order to get my notes sorted out. So that's a general introduction to the various types of photos that the society deals with. The society is privileged to hold some personal collections and I hope to remember to refer to these by name as the photos from these collections are displayed. In some cases these collections are very much family orientated as in the case of the Kenneth MacLennan collection. And here we see young Kenneth MacLennan, well known to many of us as Kenny Lemon. The society is indebted to colleagues Cathy Mackay and D.L. Smith for attention to detail in the indexing of this collection. This photograph here is KML44 and it's just named as a photograph of Kenneth MacLennan, grandson of the original. So that means that we're going to go back a couple of generations. <coughs> so we move back one generation, again within the Kenneth MacLennan collection. And here we have KML6, which is described as a mounted school photograph in poor condition. A class of boys with Ken Kenny Lemon's father here at the end of the front row, and this photograph, as far as we're aware, is from the George Watson School in Edinburgh in the early 1900s. We move back a further ge generation to our Kenny's grandfather, and this is KML3, described as a mounted studio photograph by McMahon photo photographers of Aberdeen and Strathpeffer. Kenneth MacLennan Sr. seated with one of his daughters, aged about eight or nine, very likely Joanna, early 1900s. Now, early 1900s is a bit of guesswork, but as we move to the next image, please keep this image of K. MacLennan Sr. in your memory. Moving from the previous image to this one provides a good example of how to date photographs by comparison. This is a photo of Stornoway councillors and local families taken during the early stages of construction of the original town hall in 1903. It wasn't opened until 1905, but construction had begun in 1903. Can you spot Kenneth MacLennan Sr.? He is on the far right 
if we return to the previous photo, you can see the similarity in terms of age. We have a date on this one as 1903, so we therefore conclude with a fair amount of accuracy that the previous photograph is early 1900s. The occasion here is the former placing of the commemorative foundation stone of the town hall, and this was done on the 12th of August 1903. The site for the town hall was granted in 1898. The building was formally opened by Lord Rosebery on the 7th September 1905. The opening ceremony was presided over by Provost John Norrie Anderson. This guy here. And this gentleman here is Major Duncan Matheson. We have all the names except one in this photo. I'll not bother going through them all. But this is Aeneas Mackenzie, town councillor and local businessman, beside Kenneth MacLennan. Now, moving forward to 1905, we see here Provost John Norrie Anderson accompanying Lord Rosebery on a walkabout. The direction is down number two pier after the opening of the town hall. This was in 1905. Do with this thing. This is an image of John Norrie Anderson, born in 1844. Oh, goodness sake. Born in 1844, died in 1925. And he was Provost of Stornoway from 1897 to 1909. This man's life could comfortably fill a lecture on its own. But tonight I have time only to provide a brief summary. John Donny Anderson started work in the law office of Donald Munro, solicitor and acting factor of the Lewis estate. He later became a lieutenant in the 1st Rothshire Artillery Volunteers. And in 1882, while on parade in Edinburgh, during a heavy rainstorm, other companies skirted round the deep puddles. But Anderson ordered the Stornoway boys to go right through them to loud cheers from the onlookers. Following on from the setup of his own legal practice in Point Street in 1897, his office became the hub of many commercial operations, including coal, accountancy, insurance and ship management. This man held 20 public offices during his period of municipal and civic service to Stornoway. And in the 1920s, following discussions with Colonel Neil MacArthur from Argyll, MacArthur took over the reins of Anderson's legal business, among the conditions being the adoption of Anderson MacArthur as the company name, a name which the company trades under to this day on South Beach. On the left, this poor quality photo shows a crowd of people observing a church under construction. It's the year 1909, and the church is the United Free High Church, now known as the Stornoway High Church. The significance of this photo in historical terms relates to the placing of the commemorative stone, and I think it's made of sandstone, above the main door. That's a commemorative stone. The same stone can be seen in the photo on the right, right above the door. And please note the name of the photographer on the bottom right, MacLeod, most likely William MacLeod Jr. 
And if you walk up Matson Road, you can still see that stone above the door. A drawing of this image of an outdoor ser sermon appeared in the 1957 edition of the Ilnaruch Annual. This photo, another by William McLeod Sr., has generated a lot of debate about its location. The location is behind the old Front Street building of the Nicholson Institute. Until, re until recently, the museum and now the electronic school, or e school. At the time of this outdoor sermon, the Nicholson building did not exist, and the only building behind the photographer was the Free Church School, and the sermon took place in that school's playground. The whole ground had been granted to the Free Church in 1850, and in 1852, the Free Church School was built together with a magnificent Georgian manse. Now the house you see in the background, the only house you see in the background, that's the back of Ballone House, currently the residence of Archie MacDonald. The distinctive roof light window in the middle, the middle of the roof is still there to this day but a big extension has been built on the back of the house. That's the near side as you see it. Historic Environment Scotland, in its directory of listed buildings in Stornoway, describes Ballone House as a late 19th century villa with iron railed boundary walls. But the highly significant clause in that description is, and I quote, wide single light central, as depicted in the displayed image. So we know precisely where this outdoor sermon was held. Let's turn now for a few moments to look at the lives of William MacLeod Senior and Junior photographers. This is William MacLeod Senior, 1832 to 1899. His wife was called Jane, and they had four daughters, Maggie, Jessie, Dina and Jeannie, and one son, William, who was the youngest in the family. Dina, full name Donald Dina, was the first ducks of the Nicholson Institute in 1895. The 1881 census describes William Senior as a house painter and photographer. William Senior was a prolific user of the carte de visite in French, in English, a visiting card, which was a photo printed on fine paper mounted on heavy card. It was quite small. It was something you'd give to people. In the 1870s, the process was replaced by a slightly larger card called a cabinet card. These are two examples, one of John Troncher and another of an unnamed member of the Stormy Volunteers and that's the size of the carte de visite. These were replaced later on in the 1870s by the slightly bigger ones. It's quite heavy card, and the photos printed on the card. This is one I showed you earlier on, which is of Mary Mackay, Thomas Mackay's daughter, and this one is of Sammy Newell. That's just a couple of examples of the type of systems that photographers used in that era. This is William MacLeod Jr. Born 1883, died 1917. And after his father's death, William Jr. took over the business with help from his sister Maggie. The family remained together as a unit, residing at 3 Kenneth Street, and then at 2 Matheson Road, right down at the bottom end nearly, corner of Garden Road, which William Jr. bought in 1908 for the sum of £525. The photography business went from strength to strength, but despite this, William Jr. decided to close the business in 1916 to go to service country in World War I. 
But he had been in France only for a short time when, while serving with the Seaforth Highlanders, he was killed in action by an enemy sniper at the Battle of Arras on the 16th of May, 1917, at the age of 34. This is an interesting story. In May 2015, Francis Murray, rector of the Nicholson Institute, received an email from a lady in South Africa inquiring about her grandfather, Alexander Morrison, born 1882, died 1920, a former pupil of the school. This is Alexander here. Francis passed the inquiry to Stornoway Historical Society and for a period of seven months, I had constant email communication with South Africa, completing my research in January 2016. The photo shows the lady's grandfather, Alexander, with his wife, Maria, sorry, Martha Sophia, maiden name Bota, whom he married in South Africa. Alexander left the Nicholson in 1902, having won the John Mackay Memorial Medal for Science. And after graduation from Aberdeen University with an MA second class honours in maths and physics, he emigrated in 1908 to South Africa to take up a distinguished teaching career, rising to the position of school principal and ultimately to inspector of schools for the West Cape Education Authority. Now Alexander and Martha had two children, Hester and Alistair, and my South African contact, the lady, wanted to know if I had any idea about why her grandparents had named her father, Alistair George Mackay Morrison. So I found a George Mackay in the logbook of the Nicholson Institute. He was a member of the school board, a minister of the church, and the very same Reverend George Mackay as the one we saw in the big crowd of people in front of the... So we now have a photo which matches the names from the census about the Conning family. From the left, Florence, 1894. That's the grandmother of the lady from Bedfordshire. Then David, the father of the family, 1853, the castle gardener. The wee chap in front of him is young David, 1901, known as Di. And then we have John, 1891, who is mentioned in Malcolm's book, and he lost his life at Passchendaele in World War I. And the next wee chap is James, 1899. The tall girl in the back is Violet, who is the oldest, the firstborn, 1890. Then we have Mother, Flora, 1873. Lily, 1897 and Charles, 1893, and they all stayed in the gardener's cottage. Now, interestingly, David and Flora were married in 1899, 1889, sorry, and Flora was aged 16 at that time. The first child, Violet, was born soon afterwards in 1890, and the very last child, Albert, who is not in this photo, was born later in 1913 when Mother Flora was 40. So a great range of childbearing from 16 to 40. Many of you will remember Albert Conning, who had his chemist shop at the corner of Keith Street and Francis Street, and was married to Ishbel of the other well-known fam pharmacy family, MacDonald, on Cromwell Street. This um, herring girl image is the one that was chosen by Anne Lander for their tea towel. The choice of the image of the tea towel was not only linked to the smiling faces of the Herring girls, but also to the interesting historical background which shows the sail loft, the fuel pumps of Kenneth MacLennan Oils, and one of the company vehicles with a mobile tank attached for towing. In the original photograph, the words on the tank can be read. They're just above, the, the, the words are just above the two herring girls 
that are highest up in the photograph. And the words are Royal Daylight. And that was the brand name adopted by Esso for their paraffin. And Kenneth McLennan Oils, as you know, were sub great suppliers of that type of product. No health and safety here, folks. That, in fact, is a football team that came over to play Stornoway Athletic from Gerloch in 1950. It must have been a very, very calm crossing. I don't have any identification of anybody. It was wild on the way back. It was wild on the way back. <laughs> Probably in more ways than one. <laughs> and still on the subject of sport, here we see four Stornoway golfers at the old Melbourne links. And this particular photograph was featured in the Stornoway Golf Club centenary magazine. And they are, from the left, John McLean with a pipe, Peter MacDonald, known as Peter Squeak, Dan McGregor, Callum McCauley, and kneeling down, Neil McMillan. Another interesting photograph, this time by A.M. MacDonald, George's father. This is not an original photo, this is a photo of a cutting from the Gazette. The names are down below, um, but there are some quite interesting names that I'll just, people that I'll just pick out. Right here we have Chris Munro, who was the vet. Michael Aird, Pat Aird's father. Dr. C.B. McLeod in the back there. Where's my mouse? David McGregor, in the back there, Sandy Bruce's father, Thompson, and here, Mary Thompson, Albert Thompson's wife. They stayed on plantation, just like round the corner from where I used to stay on Scotland Street. Staying on the subject of sport, this one is from Norman Mackenzie's collection. And it shows in 1975, Jimmy Mackenzie on board the fishing vessel Isabella and into a very big fish during the Western Isles Sea Angling Championship. That's a 1975. Photograph of a nurse taken in 1915. Anybody know who that is? One of the McCallum sisters. Yeah, that's Nellie McCallum in her nursing uniform, taken in 1915 during World War I. And 74 years later, she celebrated her 100th birthday. And present at her birthday among the guests was Donald Stewart, who had been her MP until 1987. So she was 100 years of, uh, of age in 1989. Another guest at the same party was uh, Winifred Ewing, who was a member of the European Parliament and happened to be in Stornoway at that time. This is the platform party for the opening of the Russell Cromarty Council offices, County Council offices in South Beach. And this was on the 27th September 1962. The building is currently where the local NHS headquarters are. And the ceremony in 1962 was led by Provost A.J. Mackenzie, who was Vice Convener of Russell Cromarty County Council. And from the left we have John the Barber MacLeod, his wife Mrs. Elinid MacLeod, Mrs. Angie MacDonald, Mr. Angie Nola MacDonald. At the lectern, Provost Mackenzie. Then in the kilt, 
Captain Matheson, who was convener of Ross and Cromarty County Council. The next gentleman in the dark suit is unknown by name, but he's possibly from the Dingwall headquarters or maybe a representative from the building contractors. And then Mrs. A.J. Mackenzie and ex-provost Roderick Smith. It's a picture of Stornoway Bowling Club in 1950. How do I know it's 1950? This photo is one of several donated to the society. And the donor is in the photo. The donor of the photo is in the, in the photo itself. And he's the wee guy sitting on his mother's knee at the end of the front row. The bowling club photos were recent donations to the society, so identification of people in this photo and another seven could be described as work in progress. The donor is Duncan Kennedy. And in addition to Duncan's mother, we can see his father up near the back. We can also see Harry Drummond here, Tommy Grassi, Ed Aldred, and over on the other side, Bill Young. And I'm sure without too much difficulty, we'll be able to get most of them. I know quite a few others, but we have uh, a few more slides to get through. This is the Nicholson Institute golf team of 1978. And if you were asked just what they were actually representing, you'd probably not guess golf. A very well turned out group of teenage golfers. An excellent example of 1970s dress and hairstyles. <coughs> and from the left, Donald Black, Alistair McKeever, brother of Malcolm Wahid, Norman Graham, son of Tarzan, Cotill Road, Ross Mackenzie, son of Maggie Jean Mackenzie, and Ian G. G. Campbell, son of Dr. Campbell, who re really hasn't changed very much in 39 years. This is uh, before heading for the town hall in 1932. A concert held in the town hall by the Nicholson Institute entitled When George III Was King. And it was done in 1932 to celebrate the centenary of the founder of the school. It was 100 years back from the year that he was born. And a full story of this can actually be found in the 1933 Nicholson Institute Annual. Fantastic clothes they're wearing here. And apparently it was a sellout production. This is a Nicholson Institute Primary One photograph from 1948. And it's cut courtesy of Donnie Mackenzie, uh, second on the back row. You see here an excellent photo of Janet MacLeod, mother of a society committee member, Anna Tucker. And I've included this photo to see if I can get anybody's help with unnamed pupils. If you can help, please contact the society. And there are only two that we haven't got. The wee girl on the left, right at the front, left of the front row. And the one who is sixth in the third row. Third row from the back, I mean, one, two, three, four, five, six. So it's this one here and the wee one at the, the crossed legs at the front. We've got um, ideas of the one in the front might be a Mary or a Mamie, but we're not absolutely sure. This excellent photo it's the first of two photos commemorating visits by pupils and staff from the Nicholson Institute to Bruges in Belgium. And this, this, this visit was in March 1954. 
On the far left, Gertrude Black. Second in, Mr. Short. Keeney McKenzie on the other side, next to Mrs. Addison and Mr. Addison. And the guy on the far right is the coach driver. Again, we have all the names. There's one that's of great interest to myself here. That one there is my own cousin, Chris Mackay, here. And the one we've already referred to uh, as having a collection within the society, our own Kenneth MacLennan. We even got the name of the dog. The dog's name is Tarzan. <laughs> and he was the coach driver's dog. I have to apologise for this, folks. It keeps on packing up. This is the second of two photos of school trips to Bruges in Belgium. And this one is dated July 1960. We know many of the faces here. Right in the back, in the middle, a very youthful-looking Mr. Angus McCormack. And to the side of him, to the left of him, um, Alistair Munro. To the right, Norman McLean. On the very left of the back row, Donny Campbell, the bookie. And on the very right of the back row, Graeme Sterling, who was a fantastic athlete sprinter at that time and was a senior sports champion. The last two ladies and the girls in the second row, second back row, Margaret Taylor, second right, and uh, I can't remember her maiden name, but I think it's Smith, but her married name is Margaret McKeever, Westview Terrace. Two cousins in the picture, hiding here, and here is Margaret Prince, and our cousin at the other end, Anne Bruce. The two on the right in the front row are Mr. and Mrs. Scott. Mr. R.I. Scott was principal teacher of English in the school at the time. This is thought to be the first full staff photograph taken in the assembly hall in 1958 after the official opening of the new building on 10th January 1957 by Sir John Stirling of Fairburn, convener of the County Council of Ross and Cromarty. My attention was originally drawn to this photo by Annette McLaughlin, who had done some work on identif identification of the staff and also, interestingly, provision of nicknames. But even after circulation on social media, some blanks still remain. I'm going to run, to give you a, just a time to have a look at this photo, I'm going to run through some of the nicknames. However, in case I get arrested, I need to omit four nicknames, two male and two female, as the legislative goalposts in the context of racism, equality and diversity have changed significantly since the 1950s. So I'm going to miss some of them out and you'll probably know who they are. But in the photo, we have Hubba, the Beetle Crusher, Marco, Taz, Lofty, Angie Nick, Sankey, Tarzan, Pug, Bill Soft, Doc Ferrier, Betty Grable, Whiskery Dick, <laughs> Miss Christina, Bella Major, Spitfire, Mon Petit, French, Benagi, the Parrot, the Hag, Jesse Bull, Bulldog, Skinny Ross, Caney, Lady Sarah, Big Uggy, Gertie, Pudding, the Bluffer, and Saucy. <laughs> Which four have I missed out? <laughs> don't, don't say it. <laughs> the Stornoway Gazette reported on the 20th October 1959 that television has come to Stornoway. Although people who want to watch it have to do so through a shop window at one of Stornoway's draftiest corners. 
They turned out in their hundreds from town and country, and they considered it worth the discomfort, and nightly clouds gathered outside McKeever and Dart's shop to view a slightly snowy picture on large screen TV sets. The opening night coincided with Eve of the Pole and the general election, but even the rival attraction of rowdyism in the town hall, police had to clear the traffic, clear a way for, for, the, for the traffic through the crowd of viewers. The following night, the progress of the election was watched by a shifting crowd of more than 100 until well after midnight. The sound was relayed by loudspeaker. And throughout this week, interest has continued unabated. The signals are picked up by McKeever and Dart's mast on Gallows Hill and piped across the harbour by underwater cable. That's a forerunner for the interconnector. Never mind. <laughs> this is the Stornoby Gazette, 1969, and it's the retirement of Commander W.A.G. Cunningham, Peter Cunningham, commanding officer of the Stornoby Unit of the Sea Cadet Corps. The guests were Commander Cunningham and his wife, committee members, officers, instructors and cadets joined the celebration to pay tribute to Commander Cunningham, who had been commanding officer for the past 15 years. The chairman was Captain K.I. McLeod. Mrs. C. Aldred presented an inscribed salver to Commander Cunningham and a gold pendant to Mrs. Cunningham. I've included this photo because it's a particularly good example of the writings of W.H. MacDonald, Willie Spuds. He was good at speaking, but he was also good at writing. And in the Gazette, he wrote the following. Now your chairman has charged me to charge you to charge your glasses. There will be no charge for this. And when you leave the festive boards, please do not charge out the door but rather retire in an orderly manner, failing that you may be charged with indiscipline. <laughs> what would William Shakespeare, the father of English language, think to know that one homonym could be used six times in the same address to express different meanings? I crave silence and request you all to be upstanding while we raise our glasses to drink a toast to our honoured guest. The toast is Commander Cunningham, May he have many years of retirement and be spared to see his sea cadets command big ships that go down to the sea and do business in great waters. I said I would return to Peter and Robert McRitchie. And this is the presentation in 1969 of Royal Humane Society testimonials. Peter was 23 then and Robert was 20. They stayed at Seven Marybank, and they'd been presented with Royal Humane Society testimonials for saving a six-year-old Patrick MacArthur of 22 Miller Road from drowning in Stornoway Harbour on the 17th January 1969. They were crew members on the fishing boat the Misty Morn, and they dived into the icy waters to rescue Patrick when he was in danger of drowning. The testimonial was presented. Testimonials were presented by Provost Donald J. Stewart, who said that their bravery, he remarked on their bravery and said he hoped that Patrick would follow their example through life. And also present was Stornoway's new police chief, Chief Inspector MacLeod, and Murdoch MacLeod, Stornoway Town Clerk, who's not actually in the picture. What's a more recent photo taken of Stornoway Society, Stornoway Historical Society Committee and other helpers on the day uh, on a visit to the Lewis Castle Museum before it opened. Another uh, of Stornoway Historical Society's own photographs, in 1914, the Earl and Countess of Wessex paid a royal visit to Stornoway. In the town hall, they were introduced to the, our chair, Malcolm, and the archivist myself by our honorary president Sandy Matheson in his role as Lord Lieutenant of the Western Isles. And you can see uh, Sandy on the right there and he's chatting to Donald Martin who is the present, um, the present uh, Lord Lieutenant in 2017. 
Uh, the royals were, were shown a small uh, exhibition relating to a war book that Malcolm was writing, and they also expressed great interest in the um, Eyalier tragedy. Now, I wonder what impression the royals would have had of Sandy <laughs> if they had seen this snap of a sponsored bike push in the 1980s. The bike push went from Stornoway to Barvas and return, with a carry-out in the sidecar, and it was to raise funds for the bike club, with 50% going to the hyperbaric unit. And uh, the gentleman who posted this photo on social media said it would have been better if the funds had been spent on haircuts, <laughs> uh, although not for Sandy. A quick look at Captain Ernest Edmund Frieson, known as Ted, pioneer aviator, who landed on several occasions at the Melbus links and, uh, in the 1930s. And he was putting a wee bit of pressure on the town council about the importance of an airstrip. He actually came back again, this time piloting an air ambulance, again exerting some pressure on the council about the importance of an airstrip and eventually an airfield was established in 1939. The next set of images is from a collection related to the society by Cot Skinner. And this event is a Rotary Club fundraiser and barbecue held in Curry Point in 1970. And the society attaches importance to this collection as it visually records numerous local people who had important roles in Stornoway in that era and were probably not regularly photographed elsewhere. This is uh, George Clavey in full voice with Roddy M. McLeod to the left and Kenny Dan Smith partially hidden by the microphone stand. Mr. and Mrs. Roddy McLeod, Roddyshan. Roddyshan was an accountant, keen golfer and a highly competitive footballer. Ian Cumming and Dougal McClarty, well-known Stornoway bankers, both keen golfers. Ian was captain of the 2nd Stornoway Boys Brigade Company and Dougal was also a highly skilled angler. Ian McMillan, well-known Stornoway dentist, who had his dental practice on Church Street. Maggie Barr, giving it lally. Mrs. Deirdre MacDonald, one of the original members of the Society's Committee, a tower of strength in local drama via Stormy Thespians, and also the writer of a magnificent feature in the Society's website on the subject of Stormy's goodie shops. Beside her, Mr. Albert Nicholl, an integral part of life in the school for 40 years, he was appointed to the Nicholson Institute as principal teacher of history and geography in 1927 and promoted to Deputy Rector in 1960. He rel rel relinquished his responsibility for geography at that time, and he retained the posts of Head Teacher History and Deputy Rector until his retirement in 1967, when the EIS conferred a fellowship on him in recognition of his outstanding services to the profession. Dr. D. R. Macaulay, who was Medical Officer of Health for the Borough of Stornoway, 1965 to 1975, previous, previously shared a medical practice with Dr. Angus Macleod at the corner of Scotland Street and Louis Street, the entrance to which was on Louis Street and then round the back of the building. And the other gent is Callum McCallum Borough Surveyor. Right at the bottom left, you can see Irma Mackenzie, Irma Flett, who was married to Billy Mackenzie, dentist. Now, what are the two men doing? They're actually taking their turn on rotating a barbecuing pig. And here is Donnie McKeever of McKeever and Dart taking his turn. Now, as we draw to the end of the presentation, I'm turning briefly to music. And I start off with a picture of somebody who's not in the archive. I lifted this off the internet. This gentleman is uh, Joseph Lyons, Prime Minister of Australia 
from 1932 to 1939. So how is this relevant to tonight's presentation and to local music? And that is because our own virtuoso pianist, Duncan Major Morrison, second from the right, toured Australia in 1936 and was given the honour of a personal meeting with the Prime Minister during his visit. In the 1940s, during World War II, Major also played for the hi hierarchy of the German army, but so far I have not managed to obtain an image. And this is Major at his own home, in amongst all his antique mem memorabilia. For those of you who don't know, his home was at the corner of Scotland Street and Keith Street, the former Lady Matheson Female Industrial School or Lady Matheson Seminary. Music again. This one is from the Norman Mackenzie Collection, the Stornoway Gaelic Choir in magnificent dress at the National Mod of 1912, the year in which they first triumphed in the Mod's premier choral competition for the Lovett and Tullibarden Shield. And in sharp contrast, a photo of a visit by the Stornoway Gaelic Choir in casual dress to a distillery in East Kilbride in 1975. I'm not sure if this was before or after they got the free samples. I don't know if Kay Mackay is here tonight. She said she was coming, but that's Kay Mackay. And a lot of well-kent faces there. Hello. I haven't got that information, so I shall. This photo was taken in 1963 in the YM Head, and the band is called the Bandits. Tony Beauty MacArthur on guitar on the left, Derek McLaughlin on guitar on the right, Tony Mull on the accordion, and Jackie Mackay on the drums. And finally, until 1989, cameras did not show proceedings in the House of Commons, although it had been discussed eight times between 1964 and 1989. In 1988, MPs backed an experiment with cameras in the chamber, and 1989 Commons proceedings were televised for the first time on the 21st of November. MPs agreed in 1990 to make the experiment permanent. And despite his opposition to the televising of Parliament, Ian Gow delivered the first televised speech to Parliament. His speech was self-deprecating and raised a few laughs when he recalled a letter he had received offering image consultancy sessions and advice on how to improve your image for television. Around the same time, the Stornoby Parliament decided to allow cameras into their debating chamber in the workshop of Smith's Shoe Shop. And this photo, which is by Michael McLennan in 2004, shows Bronco MacArthur on the left in full flow. And we just go along the road past Bronco. Donald MacLeod, Willie McLean, Willie Basher, Alec MacLeod, Frank Thompson, uh, Nori McGregor, D.L. Smith, Fred McLennan, Murdoch MacLeod, George Stewart, and right in the corner, Kenny Nicholson. And I just thought I would finish off with a look at the Stornoway Parliament. So, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes tonight's look at a sample of faces from the Stornoway Archive. Excluding the introductory slide, there were 67 slides displayed tonight. We hold 1,300, approximately, digital photographs and probably a similar number still to be digitised. And this does not include the massive collection of a whole year's work by the late Angus Smith photographer, his whole connection having been donated to the Society. As I said at the outset, it's a Society's plan to obtain equipment which will display continuous shows 
of selected photographs from the archives on the premises in the town hall. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed tonight's presentation. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions they would like to ask Ken or any clarifications? Well, if you're all rather reticent or very pleased with what you saw, I must thank Ken for his assiduous research and to, to coordinate a bit of history along with each photo. It was very well done. And uh, I hope you'll, you've all enjoyed coming along and saw something worth seeing. Uh, our, our, next, uh, our, our next presentation, if, if, if it doesn't all fall apart on the screen, will be held at the end of November. It's a Tuesday. I haven't got the actual date on the... The last, last Tuesday. Yeah. The last Tuesday the of November. The last Tuesday of the month. So hopefully you'll be along here again. And uh, I, I don't know the title. Does anybody know the title of it? But uh, it, it is one of the archivists in the Loose Castle that's coming along. So hopefully we might have something similar to what you saw tonight. Thank you all.